Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. This is my first time here in, in Georgia at a camp meeting, so I'm excited. I'm, I get the privilege of meeting some new people that I've never met before, and that's always thrilling, as well as to see people that I've seen for years and years. Welcome, everybody, to the 2013 Georgia camp meeting. Um, I'm privileged to be the first speaker, so thank you. Gary and everyone else who's involved in this. I know it's been a lot of work and uh, I'm privileged to be a part of it. Before we get started, I'd like to go to the Lord in prayer. So um, if you would like to kneel, that would be great. If not, uh, just please assume a reverent position. Our dear Father in heaven, we come to you and we thank you so much for your love, for your kindness. We thank you for bringing us from so many different places all the way here to Georgia at this appointed time to worship before you. And we just ask that you would direct us, lead us in everything that's said and done here, that it would be uplifting and edifying to everyone here, that, that truly we, when we leave this place, we will know that, that you have been here and that you've been with us. So we ask now tonight as we open up your word, we pray that you would direct us, help everything that's said and done be of you and not of us. Please open our eyes that we may behold wonderful things out of your law. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome everyone again to the 2013 Georgia Camp Meeting. The study today is called Our Examples, and I believe we have a PowerPoint ready for that. Our Examples, and I liked what Gary had a question about. Examples, I thought we only had one example. We do have one example, don't we? Jesus Christ, he is our example. Uh, but there's, there's a, a scripture, a particular strip, scripture that talks about our examples, and that's what we want to talk about tonight. First of all, let's turn to Romans chapter 15, verse 4. And I have a lot of verses tonight to share. More, I had to cut out a whole bunch of them already, but I still have a whole bunch left. So please, if you have the opportunity to take notes, if you could take notes, that would be helpful because we may zip through them uh, too quickly some, at times. I try not to do that. But let's start in Romans chapter 15. And verse 4. Romans chapter 15 and verse 4. And here it says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. It says the things that were written aforetime, the things that were written in the past, were written for our learning. They're not just interesting stories to tell our children, to keep them occupied. Instead, they are for us, for our learning. We can find... Uh, lessons from every story that we read in the Bible it has lessons for us for our learning and they're especially for us who live at the end of time they're even more for our day than it was for theirs let's turn to 1st Corinthians chapter 10 1st Corinthians chapter 10 and we'll read verses 4 through 13 that's 1st Corinthians chapter 10 verses 4 through 13 and I have made it easy for you by putting the verses up. It is good to read in your own Bibles, but uh, this, this will help us get, it, get through it quickly. But please take notes, and then you can, as the Bereans did, they searched the Scriptures daily to see if those things were so. So I encourage everyone to do that. Okay, 1 Corinthians 10, 4 through 13. Here it says, And they did all did, all did drink the same spiritual drink, talking about the children of Israel, they all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. You know that the Israelites were partakers of Christ as well as we are. Christ is the one who lights every man that comes into the world. Not just us, not just those living after the cross, but those Israelites as well. It says, they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. That rock was Christ. But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now, these things were, were our examples. There's the text. 
These things that were written were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things, as they also lusted, neither be idolaters, as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play, neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happen unto them for in samples, and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Now who is it for? It's for us. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. Did you know it's easy to fall? It says we need to take heed, lest we fall. Especially if we think we're standing. Then we need to take heed. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. That's such an encouraging verse. There's nothing that ever comes our way that has not already been tested to see if we're ready for it. Isn't that amazing? Whenever the enemy wants to come at us, they're stopped and checked until God makes sure that, it's, that we're ready for it. If we're not ready, he promises he won't let us it, he won't let us come upon us, or won't let it come upon us. No temptation will ever be allowed to come upon us unless we're ready to bear it. And that's encouraging. He's always made a way of escape. Okay, and it says that these things were written for our learning, for our admonition, especially for us in the last days. There are examples. Now, the Israelites... It says that we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. We saw some of the things that they had problems with, right? There were five things listed that they had problems with. And Paul says that they were, they were not able to enter into the promised land because of unbelief. So all of these problems that they had were a product, a symptom of their unbelief. Is that right? The root problem of their, that they had was their unbelief. And then it was manifested in these different ways that were listed, and, and we'll look at those. These are some of the lessons we are to learn from the Israelites, from their examples, our examples that were given to us for our admonition. One thing, they lusted after evil things. Did they do that? Yes. You know, one of the main things they lusted after were the flesh pots of Egypt. They got tired of this weak bread, as they called it, the manna. They wanted to go back to Egypt and eat all the, the things that they had there. Now, do you think the manna was good food? Was it good for them? Do you think there could be anything better? I'm sure that it had everything that they needed to sustain life and health. But they were sick of it. They got tired of it. They wanted the things that they had in the, in the past. They lusted after evil things. So... For us today, can we learn from that lesson? Not be given to appetite, right? The Bible even says, put a knife to your throat if you're a man given to appetite. Now, I don't believe God really wants us to commit adultery, what he's, or commit uh, suicide or adultery, but what um, he's, he's telling us is that appetite is a very serious problem. Don't mess with it. Don't be given to appetite. So this is something that is for our learning in these last days. I have a whole bunch of verses to go with that, but I'm going to skip over those. Um, next is idolatry. They had a problem with idolatry as well. And it's amazing how idolatry and appetite are linked together. You know, the Bible says that there were some that had, it says their God was their belly. Their God was their belly. So idolatry, can, you, you can worship your belly. Your appetite. And so that's a dangerous thing. Now there's also other things that were idolatry. Um, the Bible says that covetousness is as the sin of idolatry as well. So anything that comes between you and God is idolatry. 
your relationship with God, anything that comes in. So if you notice anything coming in, especially the us who live in the last days, we need to make sure to get rid of it because that could be a form of idolatry just like the Israelites. And they fell because of it and we will fall because of it too if we don't deal with it, right? All of these things have to be dealt with. Another thing it says they had a problem with was fornication. Fornication, is that something today that is looked at as normal? Even encouraged by schools, by media, by the governments? These things are encouraged and they're, they're looked at as normal. Where 50 years ago, it wasn't even considered normal. You can see just in the last 50 years what things have happened. Changes have been made. So fornication is another thing those at the last days need to watch out for. Be wary of and don't get trapped by it. And another thing, the next thing mentioned is tempting Christ. Tempting Christ. And this is one of the things I want to look at because that sounds a little strange. How can you tempt Christ? Are you going to go up and try to get him to do something bad? Is that what it's talking about when it says they were tempting Christ? The, the Bible gave an example of the tempting Christ. Um, go back here a little bit. It says, Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. There's actually a story in the Bible where they were destroyed of serpents, and it explains what that means to tempt Christ. That's one example. There's another one I want to, to look at more thoroughly. That's right here in Exodus, chapter 17, verse 2. Exodus, chapter 17, verse 2. It says, Wherefore the people did chide with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, Why chide ye with me? Wherefore do you tempt the Lord? So this is an example of them tempting the Lord when they were crying out for water. Now is it, is it wrong to want water when you're thirsty? No, that, that's fine. But they had problems saying, they told Moses, Why did you bring us out of Egypt? You bring us out here to kill us in the wilderness? We're going to die of thirst? That was tempting Christ. That was tempting the Lord. Let's go to another text, Exodus 17, verse 7. Exodus chapter 17, verse 7. This is the same story. And it says, And he called the name of the place Massah and Meribah because of the chiding of the children of Israel and because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Now notice what it says there. These are written for our examples, right? We're supposed to learn from this. And it says that these people tempted Christ by saying, is the Lord among us or not? Did they have any reason to believe the Lord was among them? Yes. Can, can you imagine walking through the Red Sea where, when it's split, two wall, wall on each side and you're walking through on dry ground? Can you imagine anything like that? And all those people in the wilderness saw that. They came through the Red Sea. Not only did they see that, they saw at Mount Sinai, they saw all kinds of other examples that the Lord was with them. The tabernacle, was the Lord with them or not? Of course, of course He was. But yet they had the audacity to say, is the Lord among us or no? How could they even question such a thing? I mean, for us... For me, anyway, living down here and thinking, I've never seen anything as amazing as they did, yet I know that the Lord is with us. How could they not know? How could they be so dull to, to think that God was not with them? But what about us? Do we have the possibility of coming to the same question? Is the Lord really with us? You know, when we come into crisis situations we tend to get temporary amnesia where we forget about what the Lord has just done yesterday. Isn't that what happened to the Israelites? He, he, they're brought out into this wilderness in the desert and they're thirsty. They, they have no water and they forget about what the Lord had just done the day before. And, and it happened more than once too, didn't it? And the Lord was given them manna every day, except for the Sabbath, of course, giving them manna. And, and here, how could they question whether the Lord was with them or not? 
Of course he's with them. But what about us? We need to think about that too because sometimes the devil tries to get us to believe that God is not with us. He's not helping you. He's not, he's not with you. That's a dangerous problem, especially for those at the last days. We need to know that God is with us. We need to know that He's working with us, that He's, he's blessed us abundantly. We have evidence as well. You know, even though none of us have ever gone through the Red Sea on dry ground, I don't think, but do we have similar things in our lives that we can point back to and say, look, look what the Lord did. I've had experiences that I liken to coming out of Egypt because they were so amazing. And if I'm ever tempted to think that God is not, doesn't care about me or He doesn't love me or anything like that, all I have to do is look back in my life and say, yes, He does. Look at what He did here, 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 here. And all of us have the same thing, right? Every single one of us have, has experiences that we can look back on and say, yes, the Lord is with us. And you know, the only thing we have to fear for the future is if we forget the way the Lord has led us in the past and His teachings in our past history. We need to remember what the Lord has done for us in the past. The Bible says to the righteous, look unto the rock from whence you are hewn and unto the pit from whence you are digged. Has anybody been dug out of a pit? I was dug out of a pit and it was a deep pit. The Lord brought me out of that and the Lord says, look at that. Consider where you came from. Look at what the Lord has done for you. And don't forget, whenever the devil comes to tempt you and to try to discourage you, don't buy into it, because it's just a lie. Amen. Okay, let's look at Hebrews 13, verse 5. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. Look at this promise here. This is an amazing promise. Hebrews 13, verse 5. It says, Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as, as ye have. Were the Israelites content with what they had? They had bread from heaven coming down every day and they were sick of it. They weren't content. So we need to be content with what we have, don't we? These are lessons we need to learn. And then he says, For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Is that a promise? We may forsake Him, but He won't forsake us. He will never leave us or forsake us. If we kick Him out of our hearts, what does He do? He stands at the door and knocks, right? He wants in. But He's not going to leave us or forsake us. He's promised. And we can depend upon that. Here's another amazing promise. John 6, verse 37. And this is... This is one that all of us need to remember, especially those living in the last days. John 6, verse 37. This is Jesus speaking. And can Jesus tell a lie? He'll never lie to us. He, he is the truth, the way, the truth, and the life. He's the faithful witness. And he says, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. Now, does that mean him that cometh to me, as long as he's good enough, I won't cast him out? None of us are good enough. Isn't that right? He says, him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. There's no prerequisite to that. The prerequisite is coming to him. That's the only thing. If we come to him, no matter what we've done, no matter how bad we are, he says he won't cast us out. He won't cast us out. You know, the unpardonable sin, the unpardonable sin is the sin that's not confessed. If you don't confess your sin, then you don't get forgiven of it. But if you come to Him and confess your sin, you will be forgiven, you will be accepted. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's the uh, 1 John 1, 1, 9. It says, All have sinned and come... Or, that, I'm not quoting that verse right, but I do want to read it. It's 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. And it says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Isn't that a beautiful promise too? We have all these promises to depend upon and they're all 
solid as a rock. None of them can fail. Ephesians 3, verse 17. This is a cornerstone for us at the last days. Because, you know what the Israelites, their problem was, they, they doubted whether God was with them or not. Look at this verse. It says that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. What was their problem? Unbelief, right? Lack of faith. They did not believe. It says that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love. And then it goes on. It's a beautiful scripture. But I just wanted to focus on that part right there, that Christ dwells in your hearts by faith. So let me ask you this. How does he dwell outside of your hearts? By unbelief. That's right. He dwells in your heart by faith. He dwells outside by unbelief. Did the Israelites have unbelief? Yes, they question, is God with us or not? He must not be here. We're dying of thirst. He couldn't be here. But yet then he makes water come out of a rock in the desert. You know, God is amazing, isn't he? Was he there all along? What about with you? Has he been with you throughout your whole life? Yes. I can tell you when I was... I came out of a pit, okay? I came out of a life of drugs and alcohol and a, a terrible background. But when I was in there, I've had several, many experiences where I can look and see, I know that the Lord was protecting me, that He had His angels watching over me, even though I was a rebel. He was still watching over me. Has He done that for you? Amen. And we can remember that. We need to remember those things the way that Lord has, has been with us in the past. Christ dwells in your hearts by faith. Do you think faith is important? Without faith, it is impossible to please God. We need to have faith. Christ dwells in our hearts by faith. Let's continue. Um, Revelation 3.20, we already had reference to this. If Christ is not inside of your heart, then He's outside knocking. You know that's the problem with the Laodiceans? The Laodiceans, it says they, they thought they were rich and increased with goods and in need of nothing. But in reality they were poor, wretched, blind and naked, miserable. Christ was outside knocking. That was the real problem. If Christ was inside living, they would have a different story to tell, wouldn't they? But he was outside knocking. So he needs to be inside living and he dwells in your heart by faith. Don't ever doubt that He is there. When you, if you've asked Jesus to come in your heart and live in your life, He is there. He does it. He doesn't just pretend. He says, if any man... This, this is a promise right here again. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, what does He say He'll do? I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. I will come in. If you invite him in, he will come in. And that's a promise. And don't let the devil ever cause you to disbelieve that. Because this is your link to eternal life. He who hath the Son, hath the Son, hath life. He who hath not the Son of God, hath not life. We must have Christ inside. It's not good enough to have him outside knocking. If that's happening, you don't have Christ. You only have him if he's inside. Okay, another, another problem that the Israelites had was murmuring. They tempted Christ and they murmured. What is murmuring? Anybody know? Complaining. complaining that's right. Complaining. Did the Israelites complain ever? <laughs> All the time, excessively, over and over again. Any little difficulty they had, they would be complaining. And yet they had shoes that lasted 40 years. <laughs> they still complained. I mean, have you, anybody ever had shoes that last that long that you actually use every day? It doesn't happen, does it? But here they had that. Their clothes didn't wear out. I mean, it, it's amazing what the Lord had done for them. And yet they had time to complain and murmur. Have you ever complained? <laughs> I know I have. Complaining is, is a, a serious problem, though, especially for those at the last days, right? We're supposed to learn from... 
what was written aforetime. We're supposed to learn and not follow their examples. They had terrible examples of unbelief, of murmuring, all these other things, tempting Christ. Philippians 4.8, look what it says. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. If you're thinking about these things all the time, will you have any reason to complain? You know, they, they say when you're tempted to complain, count your blessings. You'll very soon outnumber the reasons to complain, right? For every reason you could possibly have to complain, you can have at least ten reasons to praise and thank God. Right? Count your blessings. God has done many, many wonderful things for us. Think on these things. Don't let your mind be brought down to the lowly things because they, they don't help. They don't help anybody. They just hurt. Uh, here's a little story. I guess you could read it. But um, murmurs are like the old man whose grandchildren played a trick on him by when he was sleeping one afternoon, they went in and put some Limburger cheese in his mustache. Now, anybody knowing about Limburger cheese, I, I've never tried it, but I've heard that it's bad. It stinks. It's not good. So. Anyway, they put Limburger cheese in his mustache. Pretty soon he wakes up. Well, this room stinks. So he gets up, he goes out into the living room, only to discover that that room stinks too. And so he goes outside and takes a breath of fresh air. The whole world stinks, he says. <laughs> now, did the whole world stink? In this story, no, he, he just had a problem right here that he didn't deal with. You know, there's a lot of people who have Limburger cheese in their attitude. Where no matter what they do, no matter what happens to them, everything comes out smelling a little stinky. You know, there are some people who, no matter what happens to them, they always have a smile on their face. They always have something good and positive to say. Have you ever met anyone like that? Hopefully, some of us are right here in this room, right? So, that we can always be happy. I'm not saying I'm one of them, because sometimes I uh, have a sour look or unkind words. I'm sure we all have done that. But there are people who have the tendency of just always being positive and nice. Do you think they're following that scripture we just read a little bit ago about think on good things? Think on the positive things? You know, there's always a good way and a bad way to look at things. So look at the good way. That's what I tell my wife when, whenever I say something that's a little hard to understand. I say, if there's a good way and a bad way to take it, take it the good way. That's the way I meant it. <laughs> Sometimes we have a tendency of taking things the bad way and it causes lots of contentions. Have you ever taken something bad that really wasn't bad? When somebody says something to you or does something and you say, oh man, he, he must have done that because he hates me or he must just be low down or whatever. But you know, there may be a positive way to look at it. Um, I heard this story about uh, a pastor who he had a maid and his maid was, was sick and she wasn't able to come to work so his wife came dressed in the maid's clothes and was out hanging the laundry. And then he comes home and he goes out and he gives her a hug and kisses her. And the neighbor sees this. And so the neighbor, instead of going to check out what's going on, she starts calling up all the other church members. Hey, the pastor's kissing the, the maid. Did she take things the wrong way? Yes. And what about the Israelites? Did they take things the wrong way sometimes? Oftentimes. They neglected and they forgot to look at the big picture. They weren't able to focus on the positive. And that's what we need to focus on is the positive. We have lots of reasons to think on good things, positive things. Now, here's an example, a very stark example of the Israelites, a problem they had with murmuring, of looking on the negative instead of the positive, is when they got to the uh, Promised Land. They, the God, had, God had led them out of Egypt, straight to the border of the Promised Land, was ready to bring them in, and they sent ten spies out to check out the land, and it was a good land. Very good land. They brought evidence of it. 
But ten of those spies brought back an evil report. They said, there's giants there. We're, they're, we're like grasshoppers in their sight. There's no way. They said the land devours the inhabitants of the, there. But yet there's giants there. Somehow they didn't get devoured. But Caleb and Joshua, what did they say? Let us go up at once. They were two of the spies that went in there. Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. Were they right? Yes. With God on their side, who can fight? Who can stand against them? And God was on their side. But yet, the Israelites chose to disbelieve. No, these people are bigger than God. They're stronger than God. That was their attitude that they had when they chose to follow the report of the ten spies that gave an evil report. In fact, they decided they were going to um, stone Caleb and Joshua. They're the only ones that had a good report. Terrible. They said one to another, let us make a captain and let us return into Egypt. That's what happened. They get to the promised land, they get this report, and then they, they gave up hope. And they said, oh, let's forget it. Let's go back to Egypt. Now, was Egypt nice to them? No, they were slaves. They were complaining all the time about all the stuff that was going on there. And now here they want to go back. Um, here it says, They spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, uh, that We're in Numbers chapter 14. I'm sorry, I didn't give the reference earlier. Numbers chapter 14, verses 7 through 10. The verses we read earlier were um, Numbers 13. Uh, sorry about that. Numbers 13, 30 through 33. Just for anybody who has taken notes. Numbers 13, 30 through 33 is where they, the 10 spies or 12 spies gave the reports. Two were good and 10 were bad reports. Then Numbers 14, 4 is when they made the proclamation they're going to return to Egypt. Now we're in Numbers 14, 7 through 10. It says, And they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it is an exceeding good land. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us, a land which floweth with milk and honey. Only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. But all the congregation bade stone them with stones. And the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of Israel. So look what the, ten, or the two spies that had the good report said. This is nothing. The Lord is with us. The Israelites were saying the Lord is not with us. He's forsaken us. Completely opposite. So this is the key. These people had faith to believe that the Lord was with them. The Israelites, the majority of them, didn't have that faith. And they, because of their unbelief, they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years and, and everyone above 20 died before they got to the Promised Land again, the second time. The second time they came to the Promised Land, an amazing thing happened. <clears throat> Well, I'll, I'll just read this verse as well. Numbers 14, verse 11. It says, And the Lord said unto Moses, How long will these people provoke me, and how long will it be ere they believe me? See, their problem was they didn't believe in the Lord. Unbelief. For all the signs which I have showed among them, he had done so many wonderful things for them. They had no excuse to disbelieve. But what were their enemies doing? The enemies of Israel were trembling at the same time the Israelites were trembling about those giants. You know, that they, they were in fear of those giants, but the giants were in fear of them because of what the Lord had done for them in bringing them out of Egypt. We'll see that in just a minute. Look at this. Now this is Joshua chapter 2. This is where they came back after 40 years. They're now again at the border of Canaan. And they're just about to go over Jordan. And it says they sent spies out again. And they went to Rahab in Jericho. And look what Rahab said. She said unto the men, I know that the Lord hath given you the land and that your terror is fallen upon us 
and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. You see, all of their enemies were there shaking in their boots, hoping that the Israelites wouldn't come across that Jordan. They were in fear, for we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you. That was an amazing thing. They believed it and they knew it, but the Israelites seemed to have forgotten it. It says, He dried up the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what ye did unto the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side of Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom ye utterly destroyed. And as soon as we had heard these things, our hearts did melt. Neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. Now what kind of a warrior is that? They go to battle and they're shaking in their boots and they're certain that they're going to lose. Do you think they're going to win? No, they're, they're, they're afraid. And this is what the, the state of the enemies of Israel was like. And yet the Israelites were f fearful. They were afraid because they thought the Lord wasn't with them. But the Lord was with them. And their enemies couldn't stand before them because God was on their side. And he said, they're, they're afraid because of you. For the Lord your God, He is the God of heaven above and an earth beneath. You know, Rahab was the only person or, and those who were in her house that were saved from that overthrow in Jericho. And here again, it talks about um, what happened, the, the attitude of the enemies. This is Joshua chapter 5, verse 1. Joshua chapter 5, verse 1, it says, And it came to pass, when all the kings of the Amorites, which were on the side of Jordan westward, and all the kings of the Canaanites, which were by the sea, heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of Jordan from before the children of Israel, until we were passed over, and that their heart did melt. melt their heart melted, neither was their spirit in them any more because of the children of Israel. See, now they had already heard that the Lord had parted the Red Sea long ago, and now they find out that the Lord parted Jordan, the river Jordan, and they went across the Jordan on dry ground. And now they're just shaking in their boots, everyone over there. Do you think God had the same plan before when they were there the first time? God was ready to open the river Jordan and let them go across. And their enemies were just going to run in fear. But they couldn't, they couldn't believe. They, were, they, were, they had unbelief. Now what about us? These are all written for our learning. For those of us at the last days. Do we have enemies? Yes. And you know what? Self, right? Self is one of the biggest enemies. You know the devil will flee when you submit yourself to the Lord? Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. Submit yourselves. Here's another text. Let me read this. Psalms 118, verse 6. Psalm 118, verse 6. It says, The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do unto me? Here's faith. Romans 8.31. Similar story here. Romans 8.31. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Can anybody stand against us if the Lord is on our side? The Bible says that God is greater than all. There's nobody that can stand up to Him. And if He's on our side, what do we have to fear? Nothing. No matter what. James 4, 7. Here's the text that I was referring to earlier. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. The devil will flee from you. When you submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So your enemies are shaken in their boots. What do you have to fear? Whatever trials you have, whatever temptations or struggles, no matter what it is, there is nothing too great for the Lord. Isn't that right? Amen. Your enemies cannot stand before you. So let us quote the words of Caleb and Joshua. Let us go up at once, for we are well able to overcome it, no matter what it is, no matter what temptation, what trial, what struggle. We are well able to overcome it. Amen? Amen.
There is nothing, there is no temptation taking you but such as is common to man. God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Every temptation has a way of escape. We are well able to overcome. Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. All things, no matter what is going on in your life, no matter how bad it looks, God is able to take that situation and turn it out for good. Isn't that right? He can always do that. Philippians 1, 6. This is a very good promise as well. Philippians 1, 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Has God begun a good work in you? Yes. Here's a promise. He says He's not going to stop. He's not going to get you 50% of the way and then give up and say, well, now you're on your own. Good luck with that. No, He's not going to get you 80% of the way and leave you. He's not going to get you 99.9% .9 of the way and leave you. He's going to see you through. Amen. He is going to perform the work until the day of Jesus. Isn't that right? That is a promise we can take to the bank. We can take it to Him in prayer. He will honor that promise. Walking by faith. Look what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 7, it says, For we walk by faith and not by sight. Walk by faith and not by sight. No matter what is going on around you, don't worry about that. Think about what is real. Faith. Faith is substance and evidence. That is really what's real. Amen. Look at Hebrews 11, verse 27, the faith chapter. Look what it says about Moses. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Moses endured as seeing him who is invisible. Can we do the same? Now, he didn't physically see him. Well, there, were, there was an example when the Lord appeared to him on the mountain. But other than that, as he was walking in his daily life, he wasn't physically seeing him. But by the eyes of faith, he was able to see him who was invisible. He had his eyes focused on things above. And we can have the same experience. Romans 1, verse 17. Romans 1, 17 for therein, talking about the gospel, therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. That word just is righteous. The same word. The righteous will live by faith. We have to live by faith. Or, listen, if the just live by faith, what do the unjust do? They live by disbelief or unbelief or no faith. That's how they live. So if you live by faith, you're just. If you don't live by faith, you are not just. Isn't that right? You die by unbelief. You die by unbelief. That's right. That, that was the downfall of the Israelites. Die by unbelief instead of live by faith. Good point. Okay, 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 12. I, I just want to read this story because... This is an amazing story of faith, of seeing him who is invisible, walking by faith. Elisha, Elisha the prophet. There, there was a time when the king of Syria was having a real big problem. He was fighting Israel and everything that he tried before he ever got to do it, the, the Israelite king already knew about it. And so the king of Syria decided there must be a traitor Somebody here of our company must be telling secrets to the king. And the, then he called his servants together to try to figure this out. And they told him, there's no traitor here. It's Elisha, the prophet. Elisha, the prophet that is in Israel, telleth the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy bedchamber. He could be telling a secret in a bedchamber. The king of Israel knew it because the prophet Elijah was able to, to tell it. 
So this king of Syria got a bright idea. Okay, we know who the traitor is. Let's go get him. So he sent a whole army with one purpose, to capture Elisha. A whole army after one person, one against an army. That's pretty outnumbered, right? Wrong. The Lord is on their side. The Lord is on Elisha's side. Now look what it says. That when this army came and surrounded the city where Elisha was, Elisha's servant came and he was afraid. He said, Elisha, what are we going to do? There's a whole army out there. And Elisha said, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. There's more on our side than there is on their side. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. There was more on Elisha's side than that whole army. And that army was big. It says there was a great host and chariots and horsemen. It's a huge army coming out against him. But there was more on Elisha's side. And an interesting thing about Elisha here is there's no record that Elisha saw those, those chariots of fire. There's, not, there's nothing that says that he saw them. I don't, he didn't have to see them. He was like Moses. He was seeing he, him who is invisible. He was walking by faith. I know that God is on my side. I have nothing to fear. Even an army can't outnumber those who are on my side. Can we walk like that? We have reason to, don't we? And we must. We're going to live at the last days. We must walk like that, right? We may very well have an army come after us someday. Right? But look what happened with Elijah. Elisha. You think God can do that again? God is going to especially watch out for those people at the last days, right? He's going to watch over us. We have nothing to fear. If God is on our side, what can man do unto us? Jesus said in John 14, verse 27, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. God gives us His peace. We don't have anything to fear. There is no reason to fear. Just like the Israelites of old, they had no excuse for the fear that they had. Their, their enemies were trembling, and yet they were still afraid of them. Matthew 28, 20, another promise. Jesus says, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. I will never leave you or forsake you. I'm going to be with you. I am with you. I'm with you right now. Do you believe that? You must believe that. By faith, you believe that Christ is in your heart. Otherwise, he's not there. If, you don't believe, if, he, if he's not there by faith, he's not there. He dwells in your heart by faith. Faith is the victory. 1 John 5, verse 4. 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. So faith is the victory that overcomes the world. By faith, you can do all things. Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. This is admonition for us, especially those at the last days. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. We do need to take heed that we do not have an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily. Do you know that's our duty and privilege to exhort one another daily? Hey, brother, how are you doing today? How's your walk with the Lord? The Bible says that, and they that feared the Lord spake often one to another. And, and I know that I'm guilty of not speaking to others often enough. But I'm, I'm here to say that probably all of us are guilty of that. Can we do better? Can we speak with one another more than we do? Encourage one another? That's what it says. Exhort one another daily. Not just every week or every month. 
But it says, exhort one another daily. While it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. That's what we need is to be steadfast unto the end. Our confidence, our faith has to be steadfast and sure unto the end. Colossians 1 verse 29, it says, Wherefore I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. You know, when we have faith, it's the, the opening door to allow Christ to come in and work mightily. Philippians 2 verse 13, it says, For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. God wants to work in each one of us. A good work. His good pleasure. 1 Thessalonians 2.13 for this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. You know there's a difference between the word of man and the word of God? What's the primary difference? It's called power. The Word of God is quick and powerful. The Word of God is able to, to do, to accomplish what He pleases. What about the Word of man? Powerless, right? You know, the Bible says that God cannot lie. It doesn't say He does not lie or He chooses not to lie. It says He cannot lie. That's because a lie is telling something that's not so. If God tell, says something that's not so, what happens? It immediately becomes so, right? If I say that chair on the front row is green, nothing happens. It's still blue. But if God would say that chair is green, what would happen? Would he have to do anything more than speak the word only? All he'd have to do is speak the word only. For me, I'd have to get some paint out. Or do something else to, to get it to be green. But God doesn't have to. He just speaks the word only. And immediately the word does what, that, what it, that word says. And that's what faith is. Is depending upon the word of God only to do what that word says. The, the man who had great faith, Jesus said, he had great faith. He said, speak the word only and my servant shall be healed. See, others wanted him to speak the word plus come over to my house and touch him or do something, you know. But this centurion said, speak the word only and my servant shall be healed. And that was great faith. Great faith is depending upon the word of God only to do what that word says. And it will effectually work in you that, what is the last ver word? Believe. If you don't believe, what do you get? You don't get that work, that effectual work in you. But if you believe, you get that work. Matthew 8.13, this is the one that I referenced earlier. Speak the word only. Oh, I'm sorry, this is not the same one. Matthew 8, verse 13. It says, as Jesus said unto the centurion, go thy way. I'm sorry, that is the same one. This is just the end of the story. Forgive me for all of that. Um, Jesus said to this man, go thy way, and as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. As thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. You know, the Israelites, when they were on the border of Canaan, as they believed, so was it done unto them. We're not able to go over there. We're not able. In that condition, they weren't, were they? With that unbelief, it's a good thing they didn't go across that Jordan, right? They need to have faith before they go across that Jordan, like, like Caleb and Joshua. They were ready. They had the faith. As you believe, so be it done unto you. So you better make sure you believe and what you believe is good because that's what's going to happen. Romans 12, verse 3. This is, this is an interesting text. I just want to focus on the last part of it. Romans 12, verse 3. It says, God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. So God has given everyone faith. Even Hitler was given a measure of faith, right? 
everybody in this world who enters this world, the Bible says Christ is the light that lights every man that comes into the world. Every man has been given a measure of faith. Look at this. Luke 11, verse 13. Now pay attention to this connection. It's, it's interesting. Luke eleven thirteen, 13. Jesus speaking. If ye then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? So here he says that God the Father will give you his spirit to those who ask. You ask him, he will give it to you. Galatians 5, 22 says, but the fruit of the Spirit, so after you ask God to give you His Spirit, you need to believe when you ask Him. You need to have faith when you ask God to give you His Spirit that He does what He says. You exercise faith in, in receiving the Spirit. But look what happens after you receive the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. Did you know that when you receive the Spirit of God, you get faith? Whose faith do you get? The faith of Jesus, right? The fruit of the Spirit is faith. That's one of them. When you ask God for His Spirit, you get the faith of Jesus Christ. So now whose faith is that? It's His faith that He gives you. It's your faith that you need to get that. But once you get the Spirit of God, you get His faith. Is that good faith? <laughs> um, here it says, Romans 3.22, Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ. How do you get the righteousness of God? Is it by your faith? It's by the faith of Jesus Christ. Unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. Galatians 2.16 Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Can you recognize here that you need something beyond yourself? If all you have is your faith, you don't have enough. You need to have the faith of Jesus Christ. So, so don't worry about having faith in your faith. You need to have the faith of Jesus Christ. Revelation 14, 12. Here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. You know, if you're going to be successful at the end, to be overcomers at the end, you need to have the faith of Jesus. You need to have Jesus in your heart. You cannot survive on your own. You cannot survive with Jesus outside knocking. If that's the only thing going on, you're not going to make it, friends. You must have Christ. You must have the Son to have life. And when you have that, you have His faith, as well as His love, His joy, His peace, and all those other things. Ephesians 3.16, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. We must have this experience, which is to be born again. We must have this to overcome. Romans 1.17, look what it says here. We already read this, but we'll focus on another part of it. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. From your faith, to, to get his faith, you need faith, don't you? But don't worry, God has dealt to every man a measure of faith, so you've got it. And then it says, from faith to faith. So from your faith, you get his faith. Then you have the faith of Jesus Christ. And that can do anything, right? You have his faith. Here it says... There was a man who, who was struggling. His son was possessed by a de devil and he was really distraught. And the Lord said, if you believe, all things are possible. And it said, straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. Did Christ help his unbelief? Yes, yes he did. His, his son was healed, right? Can Christ help your unbelief? 
He can give you His faith. Right? That's how He can help your unbelief. Um, somehow I got... Sing is not cooperating. Okay. Romans 8, verse 15. Romans 8, verse 15. It says, For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. This is amazing. You receive the spirit of adoption, whereby, by that spirit, we cry, Abba, Father. Look at this next text, Galatians 4, 6. You can see what spirit that is. Galatians 4, 6. And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Now, think about this. Why doesn't the spirit of Christ just cry, Abba, Father, from heaven or somewhere else? Instead, he says he wants to give it into your hearts. He gives the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Why does he do that? So that you can have that experience, right? He is sharing that father-son relationship with you. That's why it's the spirit of adoption. It's how you become a child. Because now you have his son in your heart, crying, Abba, Father, to his father. That is amazing. Conclusion. It's a long conclusion, so I... <laughs> Hebrews 4, verse 11. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest. Now that sounds a little weird. Labor to enter into rest. Labor so that you can rest. Lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Remember our examples? Unfortunately, the examples that we're talking about today are bad examples. But they're given to us so that we do not have unbelief. We do not follow their example of unbelief. We're also given good examples, which is Christ. And we've been given other good examples. We've seen Caleb and Elisha and Moses. We do have good examples of faith. Let us labor to enter into that rest. Let us labor to enter that rest. And this is the confidence that we have in Him that if we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us. Now if Christ is in our hearts crying, Abba, Father, and helping our prayers, because we don't know how to pray as we ought to, do you think He's going to ask His Father anything contrary to His will? No, He's going he's to cry out, Abba, Father, and pray according to His Father's will. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification. Boy, that's a big word. What does that mean? Sanctification. To sanctify, it means to set apart for a holy use. To be purified. Is God's will that you would be purified? Sanctified? It is His will. If we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us. His will is your sanctification. So if you ask God according to His will that you would be sanctified, does He hear you? Amen. He hears. The ABCs of prayer. Have you ever heard of this? The ABCs of prayer. Ask, believe, and then claim the promise as your own. Ask, believe, and claim the promise as your own. I want to tell you a little story. Uh, I left a verse out of this list here. Somehow, it got overlooked. But let me tell you a story of, about an experience that I had. I was struggling with something in my life that bothered me every day. And, and um, I was not kind about it. Instead of being long-suffering and patient, I was bitter and snappy. Have you ever done that? I'm not proud of it in any way, but sometimes I, I, I found that I was doing that. I was being unkind. And one, one morning I woke up about 3 a.m. and I had three verses in my mind all linked together like a chain. 
And I could see how they all connected and went together. One of them is not listed here because it was my oversight. I'm sorry about that. W one of them is in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the love chapter, charity. It says, charity suffers long and is, you know the rest of it, kind. Well, I thought, well, I've got the suffering long part down, <laughs> but I wasn't very kind about it. I was suffering long and unkind. Have, have any of you experienced that or am I just the only one here? I, I was suffering long and being unkind and I woke up this morning and, and this verse was in my mind. Love suffers long and is kind. So immediately I, I recognized I don't have love. I don't have this love that says it suffers long and is kind. The next verse that was in my mind was this Galatians 5.22. The fruit of the Spirit is love. The fruit of the Spirit is love. So I immediately recognized I don't have the love then I don't have the Spirit. At least not this aspect of it in my life. I recognize that. The next verse that was in my mind, all linked together, was the verse we read already. If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? So immediately I knew what I had to do. And I got up. And I went and I opened the Bible and I read those verses, even though I, I had them in my mind. I wanted to read them again. And then take them to the Lord in prayer. And I asked Him... Lord, please give me this aspect of your spirit that suffers long and is kind. This is what I need. And so I prayed for that, and immediately I felt the relief, and I went back to sleep. I woke up the next day, and this thing that was bothering me constantly for a long time, it was gone as far as affecting me anymore. I, I didn't relate to it the same way. My whole attitude had changed. What was that? Praise the Lord. Amen. And you know, He can do that for us, for every one of us, in every detail of our lives. Ask God, believe the promises, and then claim them as your own. And you will have what you ask for, because you're asking according to His will. Amen. 2 Peter 1.4, it says, Whereby are given unto us exceeding great, not just great, but exceeding great. He didn't have a better word to use. So he just says, Exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. By these you're partakers of the divine nature. By what? The promises. The exceeding great and precious promises. Is there any other way you're going to partake of the divine nature? The only way is by those exceeding great and precious promises that God has given us. And one of those is if God is, if, or anyway, God is more willing to give you His Spirit than an earthly father is willing to give good gifts to His children. That's a promise. An exceeding great and precious promise. And the fruit of the Spirit is love that suffers long and is kind. And it does other things too. Whatever struggle you're dealing with, go read 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Read the whole chapter. So if there's anything you're lacking, go and do what the Lord did for me. And ask God for these things in your life. And you'll see a, ch a change. But don't disbelieve like the Israelites and say, is the Lord with us or not? Yeah. Well, yes, He's with you. He has promised to be with you forever. Colossians 3.16 Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, abundantly, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Did you know that scripture songs are an amazing way to memorize the Bible? And also to keep your mind focused on things above, on, on heavenly things. You know, sometimes I, I sing a hymn and there's a lot of wonderful hymns. I don't want to down the hymns in any way. But sometimes I have to question, is this true or not? But when I'm singing a scripture song, I never have to worry about that. <laughs> I already know it's true. So that's one thing I really like about scripture songs. They, they help, they uplift you. And it says right here to do it, to sing with psalms and, and hymns and spiritual songs in your hearts to the Lord. What if you're mute and you can't talk? Can you still do this? 
you still can do this. No matter where you are, what's going on around you, maybe you're in, brought before rulers and judges, can you still quote a psalm or think about what the Lord has done for you? Remember those good things. Thy word have I hid in my heart. This is Psalm 119, verse 11. This is a precious promise, um, instruction for those at the last days. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. You know, God has given us all these precious promises for a reason. You know, I, I, I could supply you, if I had the ability, with all the tools in the world. Just bring them all in here and give you all the tools you could possibly ever want to do any task that you could ever imagine. But if you leave them sitting there and don't do anything, do they do you any good? You could have all the tools in the world, but if you don't use them, they're useless to you. God has given you all of the promises, exceeding great and precious promises you could ever need for your sanctification. For whatever struggles you're going through, He's given it all to you. But if you don't use them, they don't do you any good. They might as well not be there. God has given them to you for a reason, so make sure that you use them. Use those tools for what they're designed for. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Galatians 6, verse 18. Brethren, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. <clears throat> you know the word grace? There's a good definition for that in the Strong's Concordance. It says the divine influence upon the heart and its reflection in the life. The divine influence upon the heart and its reflection in the life. And I pray that that would be with your spirit today and throughout this camp meeting. We're, we're here. We've come together. Let us admonish one another daily. Well, it's called today. Let us encourage one another. Let us speak often one to another. And let all things be done to edify, to encourage. And I'm very thankful to be here. I'm thankful that each one of you are here. Because it would not be the same without you. So thank you all for coming very, very much. And thank you, most importantly, for doing what Jesus said and hearing the, His voice and opening the door and letting Him in. And if there's anyone here tonight who has not done that or realizes, like I did, that I need to do it again, I need to ask God for His Spirit afresh, let's do that. And I think it's a good way to start out this camp meeting. Inviting God to come into our hearts. Inviting Christ to come in. Make His abode in our hearts. And live throughout this camp meeting so that we can gain the blessings that we're here for and not only just gain blessings but give blessings to others. Amen? That's what God wants to do for us and through us. Shall we pray? <clears throat> Our dear Father in heaven, we come to you and we thank you so much for the exceeding great and precious promises that you have given. We thank you for that promise that you are much more willing to give your spirit to those who ask than any earthly father is to give good gifts to his children. And right now we come to you as children, pleading for, with you, asking to pour out your spirit upon us. Give us your spirit. Give us this experience. We want to have that love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and all of those things that come with it. We want to have the faith of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we come to you right now and we invite you in. You have promised that if any man comes to you, you will in no wise cast us out. And I just pray that you would hear the prayers of each one of us here. I'm sure we have thoughts in, on our minds. We're, we're coming to you with prayers and we're asking for you to come in. And Lord, I just pray you'd honor those prayers and that you would come in and make a change in us so completely and thoroughly that everyone about us will say, these people have been with Jesus Christ. I pray that Jesus would be all and in all through us throughout this camp meeting, um, that God would be all in all. Because we know that when Jesus comes into our hearts, He does not come alone because His Father is in Him. So we have both the Father and the Son. And I just thank you so much for these promises. Please come in, Lord. Make your abode in our hearts. And I pray that none of us here at this camp meeting would, would ever kick you out or uh, try to take over our lives, but that we would let you have full reign and control of us. We thank you and praise you for this. In Jesus' name, amen.